And I want to also talk about if then else, which is also a very fundamental topic that we're going to focus on. Let me just go back to the new topic in elementary programming. So I'll try to just go to the middle way so I can give you guys more attention. OK. So we talk about variables and constants from last time, right? So we talk about variables are the placeholders where you might change the value for as often as you like. But the constant, no, you cannot do it. So you want to really think about for your lab number one exercise, what should be variables and what should be constant. That's something you want to uh, really judge. Okay? So now, let's go on with uh, something called assignments. Assignment simply means we have a way for you to change values for variables only, not for constant. For constant, you can never change their values. Let's go over some ideas first, and then we'll see some exercise. Okay? Now, first of all, what is an assignment? Basically, there are two possible ways you can use the assignments. One is you can initialize the value for any name constant. For example, you might say pi is a constant. The initial value should be 3.14. On the other hand, you might initialize the value of some variable, but you can change it later by doing as many assignments as you like. Okay? Okay. Now, let's see how we can uh, do the assignments for different variables. And now, how can you do assignments synthetically? The way to do that in Java is by using a single equal sign. But don't be confused. A very common source of confusion is you might have two equal signs, in which case it's not for an assignment. It's for comparison of two values, and that will return you a Boolean value, which we'll talk about in the second part of the lecture. OK, guys, come on, come on. Sit in, please. Try to be in time next time, please. Okay. Okay. So now let's go to the next point. Now an assignment operator has two operands, has two parts basically. Remember we talk about operation, either can be unary or binary. Okay. And now we're going to talk about an assignment. An assignment is basically just another kind of uh, binary operation. Let me just illustrate that to you very quickly, and then we can skip the entire slides. The syntax is really important. Because for your lab test number one, if you got the syntax wrong, it's going to be bad. Okay. Let's have a look at the syntax now. Okay. <clears throat> so now let's go back to our uh, iPad illustration over here. So what is really an assignment? Okay. Okay. What is really an assignment in Java is for you to change the value change value. Basically, that's the mere purpose of that. What's going to be the syntax? Easy. You're going to put a single equal sign over here. You might put something on the left-hand side. You might put something on the right-hand side. That's why I said it's a binary operation. Now, on the right-hand side, we're going to talk a little bit more about it. It can be any value as long as it is compatible with the left-hand side. Any expression whose value is Compatible. Okay, just come for compatible with the left hand side. It's compatible with the left hand side. Now, what can be the left hand side? There are two possibilities. When you first introduce a name constant, or when you first introduce a variable, you can put the initial value for them using an assignment. So, case number one, you can do that. You can say either integer i is assigned to something. That's when you first declare this particular variable to say, I want the initial value to be something. And then you can also say it's a constant. You can say final, let's say double, and then pi. Okay, that can also be on the left-hand side. That's case number one. So the case number one includes the declaration of some variable or some constant. That's case number one. What about case number two? For case number two, that's going to happen more often in your programs. Let's say I have declared a certain list of variables, and I may want to change their values throughout the course of my program. In which case, I can refer to any variable which I already declare. If you haven't declared the variables and you try to use it, it's going to be a type error, which I will introduce to you to more later. Also, you will see that in your lab exercise. For example, I can say i is assigned to something, in which case the left-hand side has been declared already. Okay, let's see some example right away. For example, I can say integer i is assigned 
to some value here. I can say 23 multiplied by 4. It can be any complex expression as long as its type is compatible with what you are declaring. Okay? And you can also have a main constant. You can say final, double, and then pi. That is assigned to 3.14, for example. Okay, that's case number one. What about case number two? Let's say we, have a, we simply continue from the previous two lines. And what can we do? So far, we declare two variables. We declare i. We also declare main constant pi. So we can use them as long as we want to. We cannot use anything else. Okay? So now, for example, I can say something like, I can say integer, for example, j, is assigned to i multiplied by 2. So what do I mean by that? I mean that I'm going to initialize some variable called j. What should be the initial value? It should be some expression calculated using what's the current value that's stored in i. What is that? Over here, right? That's the expression value. In which shape that would be 132. Oh, no. Sorry. Uh, 92. Okay? That's a value, right? So that means i currently is storing 92. So that means we're going to replace i by 92, multiply by 2. Whatever value it is, it's going to store in j. Okay? It can be another thing. Let's say we want to change the value that is stored in i. We can also say i is assigned to, rather than 92, it can be 100. Now let's do one comparison here. Let me put another line here. I say j is assigned to i multiplied by 2. I want you to focus on these two lines specifically, i times 2, i times 2. And then we, here we talk about, over here, j. We're going to talk about j here. Do you think these two lines are going to have the same effects as far as the values that will be stored are concerned? No, right? Think about this. At this point here, we know that whatever value that's stored in i, which is 92, multiply by 2, and that value is going to be stored into j. In this case, let's try. Okay? Let's say we initially we got i over here, I'll put i here. That's, some, that's one way to visualize it. Think of it as a box to hold the integer. Initially, i is assigned to 92. I put 92 here. And then, at this point over here, that's the second, uh, that's the, uh, and then we got another variable here, j. I'll put j here. J is going to be 92, which is the current value that is stored in i. 92 multiplied by 2 would be 184. So far so good? Okay. Now, what's going to be the effects of this line over here? When I say i is assigned to 100, you can see that we are not trying to declare anything new. We are trying to change some existing value of some variable. In this case, you can see i is referring to this placeholder. So we're going to replace its value by something else. In this case, replace by 100, right? 92 is going to be disappear, and then we will replace that by 100. Now, let's say we reach the last line over here. Now, i multiplied by 2, which is the same expression as i multiplied by 2. But are we really talking about the same i at this point? No, right? We used to talk about 92 as i at this point. But now, at this point, i has become 100, right? That means i multiplied by 2, in this case, i would be 100 multiplied by 2, 200. And then what do we store in j in this case? 200. So we replace this by 200. I will have some exercise for you at the end of this particular part of lecture. But my point is, this simple exercise here shows you how you can trace your program, okay? How you can trace. So this is something, some technique you should really try to develop throughout the course, how we can trace. Because we know that the way we execute Java code is line by line from top to bottom. Every time if you change the value of some variable, it's going to affect the way you use it from, uh, from later on. Okay, that's my point. Guys, any questions about this? Of course, we, go, we actually go more uh, far beyond just about assignments. I just want to show you different things so we don't have to stick so faithfully to the slides. Learning from an example might be the best. Okay? So now, if there's no question here, let's try. So uh, let me just uh, talk about some terminology very quickly, just before I skip this slide. So now, about the assignment over here, let's learn about some terminology. Okay? 
if I have something here is assigned to something else, and of course you put a semicolon here, don't forget, right? Usually in the uh, in your Java program. So the, the easiest way to refer to these two things, you can say this is the right-hand side, and this is left-hand side. That's very easy, okay? And we know that we want to store the value of the right-hand side into the left-hand side, okay? That's how we see it. So that we have another name. We can say the right-hand side is the source, the source of value that we want to copy over to some variable, okay? And this is called a target. This is a target variable which we want to re uh, reassign. We want to change its value over, okay? We have source, we have target. So sometimes I might say the right-hand side of this assignment, or I might say the uh, source of this assignment. I might use the terms interchangeably. So try to get used to uh, these two uh, terms, okay? Source versus target, and right-hand side versus left-hand side, okay? Any questions before I move on, okay? Okay, so now we are okay with this slide here, just go, go over that. And we also talk about what can be valid and what cannot be valid. Basically, whatever variable you declare, if you declare the variable to be a string, then you can only store string into the variable. For example, here we say Hyang is actually a string literal. Of course, we can store that into the variable for string. On the other hand, would this be, why is this invalid though over here? You gotta think about it. What's the type of the right-hand side? It's an integer, right? Like a number type. On the left-hand side, we declare the placeholder called name one, and its type is string. You cannot store a number into a string placeholder. Okay? That's why. Okay, now I want you to now look at this block of code carefully, and then tell me if the two lines of print statement is going to give me the same thing. I want you to tell me. Look at that. And you can try to ignore the uh, narrative around the uh, code. I want to focus more on the code. First of all, the, the first line of the block, are we declaring a variable or a constant? Constant, right? How do you know? Final, exactly. If you tell me that the way you, you tell from that is because PI is all in capitals, it's not sufficient. It's only a naming convention. And what really matters for the Java is when you declare final, that's really important. That means once you initialize pi to be 3.14, you can never ever change it again. Okay? It should stay fixed. Now, for the first print statement there, what should be the output in that case? Should be pi is, it's a string literal, pi is 3.14. And when you get to the second print statement there, should it be the same output or different? Well, to really judge, think about if the two things that are actually involved over there, what's the first thing involved? The first thing is, you can see the pi is over here, is actually a string literal, sorry. Pi is, is a string literal here, and the pi over here is a constant, which means we can never ever change its value. So the two parts are really remain the same. So that's why the output should be the same. Let's see another example, which is sufficiently similar, but it's going to give us different output. Why don't we try? Now, we talk about print statement involving variables, which means the variables might change its value. What do we see? First one, is this a variable or a constant? It's a variable, right? There's no final, which means you may change its value or not. It's completely up to you as a programmer. The second one, we say that integer counter is also a variable, okay? Now, let's try to follow it. We first have a print statement here. We say we want to print out this concatenation of two things, the message plus the value of the counter. In this case, what would be the output over here? Counter is one, okay? What about the second one? Would it be the same or it would be counter is two or counter is zero? Have we changed the value in between the two print statements? No, we haven't, so it should stay the same. So you will also be counter is one. Now let's see what's gonna happen. Let's say we do this line over here. What does it do? We change its value from one into two. If you think about how I did a visualization before, if you look at that over here, 
we simply just use a box to, oh, sorry, I don't have control over iPad, but we used to have a box over there. We simply change its store value there, as you remember, right? So now, counter value is now two. Let's say we do exactly the same print statement here. Exactly the same, okay? What should be the output? Counter is two, right? That's the latest value for the counter. Okay, guys, any question? Okay. Uh, if you, do you want me to actually demonstrate this to you on Android Studio? We, we can just do that, right? It's a simple tester code to write. So for any example you really have doubts, which I don't, don't have time to do in class, you should really try to really reproduce the example in, the, in your Android Studio. If you got trouble, you should let me know. We'll let the TA know. Okay. Okay, now, why don't you take just two minutes? I'll give you two minutes. So this might be the only time we can do a little bit of Android Studio programming. Okay. Uh, you know what, maybe not for this one. For this one here, I will show you the solution on the slides. If you already got access to the slide, try not to peek. Okay. Why don't you spend one minute or two, try to grab a piece of paper and try to write it to see how the program should look like. Basically, let's, let's try to read the problem together. It tells you exactly what you should do. You want to declare two variables, in which case you got to declare whether that should be a final or not. Two variables, radius and area. Initialize the, one of the variables to be 20, and then you want to compute the value of the area of the circle accordingly. And then you want to print out the value of the area. That's what you want to do. Okay? Why don't you try on a piece of paper? And then we'll go over the answer line by line. Okay? There will be a slight extension to this, which I will illustrate to you on Android Studio. I'll do that in a moment. But for this simple one, I want you to just try, okay? So that's kind of the syntax you should really try to get used to already, okay? It's already week two. Think about how you can do decoration and try to be as syntax correct as possible, okay? Okay, let's take another 30 seconds to save time, but at least you should really think about in your mind, this could be some written question in your lab test, right? It might be a combination of written test and computer test. So really try to make sure you can do it. Okay, what about we go over the answer? First of all, how do we declare? So now, what should be the type for the uh, area and radius in this case? Should it be, so they should be numbers, right? In this case, should you declare them as double over integer? That's a decision to make, okay? It turns out, for this particular example, think about what's going to be involved in the computation. We know the formula for calculating this, the area of a circle should be pi r squared and pi itself is 3.14, which has a fractional part. That means, that means eventually we will get most likely some fractional part for our answer. So we better make everything to have a fractional part. Okay? That's how you can think of it. Why don't we try? First of all, uh, this is how you de uh, declare the tester. Again, you do not memorize these two lines of code. If I do test you on this in the lab test, I'll give that to you. You don't need to memorize it. Okay? But you should know how to do it off the, uh, outside the class. So now, first of all, let's declare. We declare two double variables, radius and area. So they can store anything, any number with a fractional part. And then, after decorations, how do we initialize the, uh, the radius? We simply just reuse. You can see over here in this line here, it's really important to notice, we don't say double radius is assigned to 20 again, because we already declared that, okay? Okay, and then after that, we can reassign the area to be pi r squared radius times radius times 3.14, okay, whatever the value is. If you really like, you can also declare this 3.14 as a constant if you wish. Okay? I'll show you exactly how to do that in, in a, small, a slightly more complicated example. Okay, after that, 
we can just print out the value of the area for this particular circle. That's how we can do it. Okay? It's a simple program. In which case, we kind of hard-coded it. You can see the value of 20 over here is actually fixed. What if I want to calculate a different area of a different circle? That means I gotta modify this value here from 20 to, for example, 40. It's not a convenience. So it's really actually quite useful to actually have some flexibility over here. Why don't we try? Okay? That's something I want to demonstrate to you very quickly. Because you need this kind of an input-output interaction with the user for your tester, for your testing. So now we want to be more flexible. The way to do this is we can introduce some mechanism to accept inputs from the keyboard, for example. Okay? And you should really, I will show you some correspondence from the keyboard to whatever key press you have on your mobile screen. Okay? They should be consistent with each other. Okay? So now, I'm going to demonstrate to you on the Android Studio how we can use this particular uh, mechanism. The class we're going to import is called Scanner. Okay? It's a library class where you have to import. But I'll show you, show you how you can do that. If you have Android Studio, you can open it, and then let's see how we can do that. Okay? Okay, let's go back to Android Studio here. Okay, over here, let's now go under Elementary Programming Tester. Let's create a new one, just to be clean. So now, let's go under Java and go under Elementary Programming here. Oh, is it the one? Sorry. Under Java, and then we should go under Elementary Programming. Okay, so let's just create a new tester. If you right-click, New, Java Class. Let's call Circle Calculator. So again, as I said that last time, in the class for illustration, I'm just going to show you Tester. You should really try to build a simple app to see how you can do this. The way I do the Tester will be very similar to how you do the Controller, the Activity Class. Okay? Let's try, very quickly. Okay, call the Circle Calculator, and say OK over here. And then I'm going to maximize it just by double click. Okay? Now, first of all, let's declare the main method. That's the main thing. Again, you don't memorize. Public, static, void, main, string, arts. Okay, let's see what we should do over here. Always the first line, we want to introduce the library class. And the way to introduce it is by using some code completion feature. So that will put an import statement for you. First of all, you can see that right now we don't have any import. No. However, let's see how we can introduce it. So now, I want you to type just partially towards scanner. S-C-A-N-N. -N. You can see scanner from java.util. Util is a package in Java which got many, many useful classes there. We introduce you more as we go along the course. But scanner is definitely a useful one. Okay? Just click on enter. You can see that it puts the import over here for you. Very useful. Scanner, let's give a name. I'll just say input. It's new scanner over here. Again, this line here, you don't have to worry about it. You can just use it. Okay? You don't, you don't memorize it. System.n. System.n over here simply means whatever we're going to read as input comes from the keyboard, from my computer. Okay? That's standard input. Okay? Now, let's try to make the application a little bit more interesting. The scanner is going to allow it, the input over here is going to allow you to read integer, to read double, or to read string from the user. Okay? Why don't we try? Okay? Let me make it a little bit more interesting than the one that you saw from the uh, uh, slides. System.out.println. Enter your name. Okay? This is something we output to the screen uh, for the user, like an instruction. Now, for us to take something from the user, we can call some method on the input objects over here, input, which is of scanner type. Now, I can see that, I can say that, I'm gonna read something from there, like a string. String name is assigned to input dot next line. Okay, I'll, uh, when you see the slide, I, I already listed all the common methods you can call on this particular scanner. Okay, I'll just show you one example. Now, once we get a name for the user, we can try to be more friendly to them. Let's say, if I enter Jackie, you will say, Jackie, now enter a radius for the circle. How do I do that? System.out.println. 
Okay, and then over here, I would say, whatever name it is, it can be Jackie, it can be Jim, it can be Jonathan, any name you like, plus, okay, comma here, enter a radius. Now, we know that a radius is going to be a double type, okay, as we learned from the previous simpler version. So now I can say double over here, it's a type, and then radius. It's assigned to input dot, so we used to have a next line. So now we want to read a fractional number from here. We can say next double. Okay, like that. So once we have read that, let's do some computation before we return, we return the computational result. So now let's calculate that. Let me just make a good uh, practice for you. So now you can also declare the constant. Final double, and then we can say pi, all capitals, is 3.14 over here. And then, Let's try this. If I try to uh, compute area, another variable here, double area is assigned to pi r squared. So for r squared, you can just say r times r. There will be some library class called math, which I will introduce to you a little bit later. For now, you can just do uh, radius times radius. Okay, now, is my code correct so far? No, right? Yeah, it's a very common mistake, which I saw from your lab, right? Whenever you see anything that's red, bad. Very bad, okay? So now I'm just gonna fix it. Okay, you can see that the code completion will help me with that, okay? So now, once I have got this thing over here, I need to output it to the console, or I want to display that into the screen in case you're developing an app. So now I can say system.l. I think that some of you actually mentioned to me, I can say S out. Ah, that's a very good shortcut. If you simply say, I'm sure you can, in case you didn't see that. S out, okay, standard outs. Hit enter, it shows you that line directly. So you don't need to type it always. Okay, now we can say, now, name, whoever name it is, you can see the name over here is referring to, if you put your mouse over here, it shows the highlights for the re relevant variables, which, which means the name was first declared and in, in initialized over here. It was used the first time and used the second time. Okay, now let's say what, uh, whatever name it is, plus area of circle. Okay, let me show you one more thing. Sometimes if you want to actually do, maybe the single line you're trying to print out, will take you multiple lines to program. This is what you can do. I'll just say print, okay? Print simply means no new line just yet. I want everything together to be in a new line, in a single line. Area of circle, okay? And then it's out. Okay, let me just get rid of the LN. LN here stands for new line, okay? Area of circle with, okay, let me say no space, with, radius and plus. We know that it's whatever radius we enter. Okay, finally, I can say this is the end of the line. The L dot print line has area plus area. So this small example here shows many things over here. It shows about how you can declare constants, how you can declare variables, how you can do computations, how you can print things out, and how you can read things in. Many things, okay? Why don't we try? You will see that this kind of program here is more interesting. And later on, when we learn about how to do loops, you can make the game even more interesting, but we'll get there in a moment, uh, maybe in a few weeks' time. Why don't we try, okay? Again, let's now go to that particular class over here, and then right-click, circuit calculator, right-click on that, and then say run. Let's see what's going to happen. Okay, it's not building. Let's wait a bit. Okay. So this is kind of the thing. You want to think about how you can do the same developments into your uh, Android app. Could not find. Hmm. That's embarrassing. Could not find this. You know what? Let me try one more time. It may have to rebuild my project somehow. Sorry, I should have tried this uh, before this class. Okay. Let me try the following. Let's say build, rebuild the project. Why don't we try that? Okay. 
Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work at this point. I will fix it, and I will tell you guys exactly how to fix it next time. How about that? To save time, okay? But, but, if you have been co uh, copying my code, it's okay, because it's actually correct, okay? That's something I'll promise you to demonstrate, okay, next time. Either, either like this, or make a video, okay? But any question about how to write programs like this? Any questions? Are we okay? As I said, in this course here, we assume no programming knowledge for Java. However, it's already now week number two. We go rather fast. That means you really have to work a lot to really catch up. Yes, question? Is the, is the scanner a class of, uh, that's already built into Java? Good question. The question was, is scanner class a, a already built-in class or something that you have to do yourself? The answer is, it's a built-in class. It's called a library class. We'll see many, many other library classes throughout the course, but for now, for your tester to be a little more interesting, scanner is the one to use, okay? So scanner is something that you just use, and the only prerequisite is, before you use it, you have to put import over here. That's the only prerequisite. But if you forget about that, you can always use a code completion feature in Android Studio to do that, okay? Guys, any questions? So I better stay away from Android Studio just for today. Okay, I'll test it next time before I come here. Yes? Uh, when you made the new Java, when you made, when you made this program, yeah. that, was that a, the first one, was that already there? Did you say the, the you package, mean, ECS, elementary? Oh, I see. The question was, how did this line come from over here? Package over here, ECS 1022 elementary programming, okay? The, the answer is, when I first uh, created this class, you already put a line for me. Because thinking this way, when I, tried, when I said right click, where did I right click on? I right click on this particular package over here, which is EECS 1022 elementary programming. So if I right click on this particular spot, it's going to put in the line for me. That's something you don't have to do by yourself. And similarly, if you create any classes for your lab exercises, it's also going to do that line for you. Okay? Yeah, good. Okay, now let's go back to the slides. Okay, so now for reading input and output, that's exactly what I put on the board on the Android Studio. That's something you can try. Let me summarize uh, a little bit. So basically, I, I don't want you to get too confused. You might be thinking, when should I read from the keyboard, like a physical computer here? And when should I read it from my mobile screen when I type? There are simply two different ways of reading input from the user, depending on what you need. For Android programming app, your final product is going to allow the user to enter input using mobile screen keyboard. That's one thing. However, when you are trying to develop your program, you want to test. When you test, you better use a scanner to help you test. Okay? That's some workflow you want to get used to. Okay? So there are two equivalent ways of reading user input. You can either buy a physical keyboard where you use scanner, it's a tester. Or what we learn from tutorial and your lab number one, you're trying to read maybe from the text field, right? And then to uh, search for that using the ID of the GUI components. That's also another thing you learn. So there are two things you gotta learn. We can practice this throughout the course. Guys, any question about scanner before I move on? Okay, so over here, there are three uh, common methods you can use for the scanner. You can either read the next integer, next double, or next line. So these are the three methods you can use, okay? So come back here, all right. Okay, let's see the next slide. We'll talk about some new things over here. So that's something I would like you to practice as much as possible. If you really get stuck in how to use scanner, talk to me during the lab session, okay? Okay, now let's see some common mistake, which I already mentioned. The number one mistake is, you don't try to declare the same variable for more than once. You only declare that only once in your program. For example, over here, you can see we've got two variables called counter. You declare that more than once. That's a common mistake. So now, there are two ways to fix this. And there's no, there's no right or wrong, depending on what you need. If you really meant to have two separate variables over here, maybe counter one, counter two, which means there are two separate placeholders. In this case, you might want to say int, int counter one is assigned to one, int counter two is assigned to two. That's one way to fix it. They're separate placeholders. That's one way. Another way, you may want to say I have only one placeholder called counter. However, its initial value is one, 
and I want to change its value to 2, it's only one placeholder. In which case, you should, you should really get rid of the second int decoration, right? Let's see what I really mean by this. So fix number one, you may just want to have a single variable, in which case you would say int counter 1, counter is assigned to 1 initially, and then change that from 1 to 2. There's, there's only one placeholder. That's one way to fix it. Another way to fix it is you do want to have two counters in this case. In that case, you will simply say int counter and then int counter 2. So they are different names. Which one to use? Completely up to what you need. If you need one counter, fix number 1. If you need two counters, fix number 2. Okay. Questions? Okay. Okay, now, and also, this is also another common mistake. Hopefully, you're getting more used to it. Whenever you try to use a variable, especially on the right-hand side or as the source of an assignment, you want to make sure whatever variable you refer to, they're already declared, okay? You can never use something that has not been declared, okay? Let's see one example, very easy. Let's say over here, now, tell me something. Which line, let's take a guess, if you put these four lines into Enjoy Studio, which line is going to give you a red underline? One, two, three, four. I heard one, four, one, oh, okay. Okay, which part of first one? Which part of the first line? Counter, exactly, why? It's not declared, exactly. You can see that it's actually quite hilarious if you look at this program here. Line number one, you try to use counter, it was only declared in line number two, right? It's now, again, it's simply because we try to execute the Java code line by line from top to bottom. So when you reach the first line, the counter must have been declared already. Otherwise, it compiled an error. Okay? Good. Very good. And now, how do you fix it? Now, declare that first. So now you can see that I try to put the declaration here to say counter, for example, the initial value is 1, and then I try to uh, use it. Okay? Go ahead. All right. Okay, let's move on. Again, always remember it's from top to bottom. It doesn't go randomly. Okay, case study number two. This is some interesting case study. If I give you some integer value expressed in seconds, I want you to somehow convert that into hours, minutes, and seconds. I'll leave this as an extra exercise for you. Do try them. You do have the slides, but I'll, I'll, if I were you, I'll try not to peek. Why don't you try to take it as, as a lab test and do it on your Android Studio? Create a tester and then test it using scanner and you'll be very similar to how you did for the compute, uh, circuit calculator example. Why don't you try that? Okay? You can try that after class, not, not, not today. Okay? okay, I'll skip that. Okay, now let's do the little bit of summary at the moment. So whenever, whenever we say an assignment over here, so we have the syntax, it's a single equal sign over here. The right hand side is a source, the left hand side is a target. So now, let's think about, just in general, to give you a little more idea, what can really appear on the right hand side? As you move towards the end of the course, the right hand side can be as complicated as you like. But let's see some examples which we have seen already. Okay? Why don't we try that? And the simplest case, the right hand side can be either a literal or it can be a variable. Okay? Now let's try this. When we say integer i, declare that initial value is 23. In this case, the right-hand side is a literal, right? The uh, it's a literal of the right type. Second line, now I say that integer j is assigned to i. So now think about what this really means, okay? I want to explain this. It's simple enough. I want to really get your mind through. Because if you think about the other way around, it's completely wrong, okay? When I say integer j is assigned to i, what do I really mean over here? So later on, when we talk about objects, you will also get some similar construct over here. So let's understand a simple case first. Okay. Oh, I left my Apple Pen upstairs. Did I, did I do that? Maybe I did. Okay, let's uh, get my Apple Pen. All right. So now, I want to think about, are we copying from the right to left or left to right? Right here? Hmm, interesting. Where did, where did I put it? <clears throat> okay. 
I must have put my Apple Pen somewhere. Ah, oh, there we go. Okay, too much exercise. Okay, so now let's think about that. Okay, let me now go back to our iPad over here. Let's try this. See exactly what's happening here. Integer i is 23. Let's go line by line. What this line does, we have a placeholder that we declare to be i. It stores integer only. And then initial value is 23. We store only one value at a time. Now, second line. Integer j is assigned to i. So now what does it do? Are we trying to declare i and then put j into it? Or are we trying to put i's value into j? One or first? Or one, sorry, one or second, one or two, right? So now, think about it. Now, this is the source of the assignments. This is the target of the assignments. We're always trying to store the source value into the targets, right? So now, the target over here is integer j, which means we are trying to declare just another variable over here, j. And then, what should be its initial value? It's going to be i. So what do we mean by this? That means we're going to make a copy of the current store value in i and copy that over into j. The current value for i is 23. And we're going to make a separate copy over here. If I now try to do 23 over here, I'm going to just copy that over. Now, a question for you. Let me just make it one more line beyond the slides. Continue from this. If I say i is assigned to 46, okay? Now, this is really important. If I say i is assigned to 46 over here, how many placeholders do I have to change? One or two? Just one, right? Okay, now, there's something I want you to know for now because later on when we talk about objects, there will be some slight complication coming in. But for now, since we talk about integers, or some simple types, so that's okay. So now, what this line will do is, i is assigned to 46, we go to the placeholder called i over here, and then assign that to 46. So you can see over here, 23 stays the same in j. Okay? Questions about this? Are we okay? Okay. Okay, so now let's see the second case. Now, it can also be some expression involving literals and variables. Let's see how that can be the case. You can say i is 23, and now j is, rather than just i, I say some expression about i. i multiplied by 2, right? That means whatever i value it is currently storing, multiply by 2. In this case, 23 by 2, 46. So I stored 46 into j. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense to you. But in general, this right-hand side expression can be as complicated as possible. That's something you should really try to be uh, try to get used to. But we'll get there. Number three, it can be some input from the keyboard, which we have just seen. Okay, it can be, for example, you declare some scanner input, and then you say input on next end, which is more like a method call, which you can just take it for granted. It's a library call. It's uh, using some library method that has been implemented for you. You don't have to worry about how it is implemented. You can just use it, okay? Now, input on next end is gonna read some integer from the keyboard, and then we're gonna store whatever that's read into i, okay? Let's say if I type 23 on my keyboard, right? So this i is going to store 23. If I type 46, then i is going to store 46. So it has some very, uh, has some, how to say, uh, unpredictability over there. Okay, and then whatever i it is, I'm gonna multiply by two, okay? So that, so this block over here is very similar to about a circle calculator I just illustrated, okay? One more thing. This one should be very similar, familiar to you up to now, I hope, since we have already talked about the tutorial series uh, last week. So now, let's see how we can do it. For example, you can say string text weight is a string variable, and what should be the right-hand side? The right-hand side can be we just get a helper method call to really get the text field input by using its ID, right? It's a method call. On the right-hand side, it's going to return some string to us. 
and then we can assign that and store that into text weight. Okay, that's one thing. The second line, we can go a little bit further. We can say, now, given this text weight over here, we can try to, sorry, if you can see that. Okay, we can try to convert that into a double, right? You can see that over here, we say that. Uh, if you can see text weight over here, and then we can parse double to convert that into a double. Right? So these are the two different ways that you can try to use the right-hand side. Any question about these uh, possibilities over here? I'm trying to summarize to you first. If you still feel a little bit not uncomfortable with each one of them, talk to the TA or talk to myself during the lab. Okay, okay if no questions, I'll move on. Okay, now, the most confusing topic for this particular lecture. Okay? We have basically two kinds of conversion. One kind is going to occur automatically. The other kind is going to occur only manually, which means it only occur if you do it. Okay? We've got two kinds. One is called coercion. The other one is called casting. Okay? I think one of you guys at the front asked me about the uh, conversion. So here's the time. Okay? Let's try to understand from examples. Okay? Let's try. Coercion in some ways is very easy. So basically, first of all, let's understand coercion. Uh, it's just a term. Okay, why don't we try to understand the idea first before you memorize it's actually called coercion, okay? First of all, it's going to be implicit, which means it just is done for you under the hood. You don't have to do it explicitly, okay? It's gonna be automatic. For example, let's try this. If I say double value one is assigned to three times 4.5, okay? Let's think about what this is going to do. Okay, let's now do this. Uh, let me just do some illustration for you. When I say double value one is three times 4.5. Now let's think a little bit more carefully, more strictly, uh, let's say. Should this expression here be type correct? Let's try. Let's talk about strictly just about types. Three here, apparently it's an integer. No fractional part. Also, 4.5 over here, it cannot be an integer, agree? It does, not have a, it, it does have a fractional part, which is not supported by integers. So this is more like a double type. So strictly speaking, this multiplication here should not be type correct, strictly speaking. However, it's very easy to make it type correct, very easy. By what? If I simply say, now this is three over here, I can make it type correct by simply saying, well, I can say 3.0, right? So what's 3.0? It's simply integer three, but the fractional part is simply just zero. It, it's there, but just happens to be zero. So, so now after this, you can see that this has become a double. Now, strictly speaking, we are trying to multiply double by double. So now this makes sense. So now this kind of conversion over here from three into 3.0 is going to be done automatically for you. You don't have to worry about it yourself. You just, the Java execution machine or compiler, you will simply do it. Okay, so this is called coercion. Coercion. Okay, it's a very specialized term, but you can, or somebody like to call it promotion as well. Promotion in the sense that you're trying to promote something that does not have a fractional part up to something that has a fractional part. Okay, either coercion or promotion, but you know both. Okay. Any question about this one here? So I was trying to explain to you the whole entire story. Yeah. What if I change the double to Good question. The question was, what if I say, it's a very good question. It kind of linked to the next slides. Okay, let's try that, Why don't, shall we? So now the question was, let's say I still have three multiplied by 4.5, and then I know that due to coercion, this guy here is going to be promoted or coerced into 3.0. So this is a promotion or coercion. Okay, I know that 3.0 and 4.5. Now, the question was, if I simply try rather than double, I say, 
integer, and then let's say integer value one. Now, do you think this is going to be error free or? Well, since I'm asking you, this should not be error free, right? Right. Why don't we try? So now, thinking this way, mathematically, mathematically speaking, we know that we are trying to multiply a double, which may or may not have a fractional part. The fraction mark can be zero. That's what I meant. And it also has a fractional part. It should be uh, 13.5, right? So that's the uh, answer. Now, integer over here is not really compatible with 13.5 because integers are values like 13. It can be 5. It can be 0. It can be 135. You can never have the decimal point, right? So that means this guy here with a fractional part is not compatible with the integer here. In some way, you can think about integer has very little information that's needed, only the integral part. But now for double over here, it has strictly more information to be encoded, in which case it would be the integral part and also the fractional part. So you just cannot store that. Okay? Let's understand that first. So if you simply do this over here, if you simply do the integer over here, it's not going to compile. No, that's not compile not compile because you cannot store 13.5 into an integer placeholder or variable, let's say. That's to be more formal, variable. Okay, let's first of all understand why it is not good, okay? And then we'll talk about how you can fix it as a workaround. Okay? Now let me duplicate this, and then let's do it again. So now let's say integer here. Let's say I really want integer. Let's say I don't have enough space for, on my computer because for integer it's only 32 bits, but for double or for or even a one, in general you take it takes more space to store um, fractional numbers than integers. So let's say integer value two, or value one. Let's be consistent, and then three multiplied by 4.5. Again, we know that this guy here is going to be 13.5. Okay? We know that if you simply do this, it's not going to compile. Okay? Now, how can we comp compromise a little bit? Now, in order to store this into this, if you want to make a compiler happy, you have to compromise by truncating or sacrificing some information, which means by losing some information, we can actually get something that can be stored into integer. Now the question is, so you got two possibilities. Either you can lose the integral part, which means I only store 0.5 into it. Well, in some way, that's, we still got a fractional part, right? So it's not really good. We can sacrifice the uh, fractional part, which means we, we only store 13 into it. That's another possibility. So it turns out, this is the way to go. Okay. So now, to really store 13.5 into the integer variable, what we can do is, we can tell Java, now, I'm going to store this value here, however, I'm not going to worry about the fractional part. You can just get rid of it. You can truncate it out. Okay? So now, let's try to follow me. This is the right syntax to write. It's called casting, which is exactly the topic for the next slide. Let's try. So now, what you should do is, you will say integer over here, value, and then it's assigned to, we used to say 3 multiplied by 4.5. Okay? Now here's a new bit. You have to manually insert. That's something you gotta done. It's gonna be done explicitly. How do we do that? So now, parenthesis, like that. And then somehow you wanna say, to what type do you wanna compromise this into? I wanna compromise a double type into an integer type. Okay? That's something called casting. So what does it do? Okay. Now, let's try to understand this assignment here very carefully from what, from what we learned. First of all, over here, we declare an integer placeholder called value one over here. And then we say that we're going to not store everything that's contained in 13.5. We're only going to store the integral part, which means only 13 is going to be stored. In this case, only 13 here. So somehow, after the cast, okay, let me just try to illustrate to you. After the cast, 
after the cast, 0.5 is truncated. Okay, so we only store 13. We lose the 0.5. Okay. Okay, let me summarize by using uh, some contrast over here. Now, a little bit quiz for you. How about that? Number one, double D is assigned to 23. Number two, integer I is assigned to 46.23. One and two, independence. Which one is going to compile? Well, neither. Okay? For number one, if it's going to compile, is, it going, is coercion going to happen or cast? Coercion, right? Because we're going to promote 23 to 23.0, right? So number one is okay. Because we're trying to store something that requires little information to something that can accommodate more information, the fractional part. So in this case, we do have a placeholder here, but now be careful. It's going to store 23.0. Do me a favor, try to put this line here in your tester when you go home and try that. If you try to print out D over here, it's not going to tell you it's 23. It's, it's going to tell you it's 23.0. Okay? okay, for number two, is it going to work or is No, good. Good, very good. And how do we resolve that? Casting. Okay. Now, it wouldn't compile unless you try to fix it by integer i is assigned to, I want to cast the 46.23 into integer. Okay, that means I have an integer value placeholder and it's going to be 46 over here. Okay, so hopefully these two illustrate to you coercion and casting. But there's more to say about casting in just a moment. Any questions? Guys, are we okay? Okay. Okay, good. Okay, so now we can go through the rest for this particular slide. So now, for casting over here, that's something we just talked about. We're simply going to throw off all the fractional part. So now, usage number two is the most confusing one. Okay, let's try. I'm going to illustrate to you over here. Let's use an example here. Okay. I'm going to use iPad. Let's go step by step. Let's say the following. If I say, uh, let's say print, I'll just say print line. Okay. I'm going to put some expression over here. Okay. Now, if I have the following, 1 divided by 2. What should be the printout? I give you options, 0 or 0 0.5. Who thinks that should be 0 0.5? OK, 0. OK, more people there. If you're not sure, you're in trouble. Okay. So now, division here. Remember the principle we talked about. The principle is very easy. Whenever you talk about division, and this is not specific to Java for any other programming language, when you talk about division here, it does not necessarily will give you the precise result mathematically, depending on what's the type for the two operands. In this case, because both operands, they are integers, that means it's going to give you the quotients, only the quotients. So now that means these are integers. One divided by two will be zero remaining one. Right? So that's why it will only be zero. Okay? This is integer, and this is also integer. So that will give you the quotients. And of course, if you want to do the remainder for integer division, you can use the percentage, percentage sign. And we talked about it already last time. Okay? Now, let's say I want to somehow force the Java compiler to evaluate to me, I really don't want zero. I want 0 0.5, okay? How can I do it, okay? Remember, when we talk about the principle for division, it's only when both operands are integer is it going to comp uh, compute the quotient. If any one of the operands happens not to be an integer, if it happens to be a double, in this case, it's going to give me the precise result. 
For example, if I try the following, I'll show you one possibility. Okay? Okay, this one is gonna take a little bit of understanding. I'll try to do one by one. Let's say this. Now I want to make this particular operand over here, I want to promote it or I want to cast it in from one into one point zero. Okay, let's see how we can do that. Of course, the, now what we can do is you can say you can say something like this. Double over here is a cast, right? And then I say I put one over here and then cast that first. And then after the cast, divide that by two. Okay? Somehow I'm using the parentheses over here to force the order of evaluation. That means I'm going to do this particular cast first. Cast one into a double, which is 1.0. In this case, it's going to give me 1.0. And then 1.0 divided by two would be whatever value I want, which would be 0.5. That's one way to do it. Again, this actually uh, is consistent with the principle we had. As long as one of the operands for the division is not integer, it's going to calculate a precise result. I'm just trying to make one of the operands not to be integer. And we can do, apply the same principle. Now we can try to cast the second operand. Let's try that. Print line over here. Okay, so now let's try, let's say one stays the same, the same as before. Okay. Over here, let's say use red over here. Let's say one stays the same. It's going to be, going to be divided by something that's not integer. I can do a cast. Double, and then I want to cast two into 2.0. And I want to do this first. I'm just using parentheses to force the evaluation. Okay. Now, what this will do is, so this part over here is going to cast two into two point zero. Right. So it's going to be two point zero over here. So one divided by two point zero, again also is going to be zero point five. Okay. Similar. If you want to go extreme you can cast both into double. Okay, why don't we try as well? But the syntax is really important. You can see that this opening parenthesis here matches this closing parenthesis over here. And this one over here matches this one over here. Okay, that's something you should really pay attention to. Okay, let's try one more. Print line over here. Okay, uh, and I need a little more space. Let's say up to here. Okay, it's gonna be a division over here. I'll try to cast each one of them, both of them. Okay, let's try first one. I'm gonna do a cast over here. I'm also going to do a cast over here. For the first cast, I'm gonna cast one into 1.0. And let's first do a double. Double over here. And then one. Okay, and then let's do another one here. I want to cast also 2 into 2.0. Double is going to be a cast over here, and then I'm going to put 2 over here. So now let's try to analyze that. And over here, this guy over here is going to evaluate to 1.0. 1.0 over here, and this guy over here is going to evaluate to 2.0. So now, if I do the, the division there, because at least one of them is not integer. So that means 1.0 divided by 2.0, 0 0.5 as well. So one, two, and three, they give me the same result. You might have some question on, in your mind. In this case, why don't we simply say 1.0 divided by two? Why, why are you doing a cast, okay? It's because in general, you may not have just the values right away. You might have some variables. Let me show you. Let me do another example here. Integer i is 23. Integer j is 5. Okay, now, if I say print line, i divided by j, 
What do I get? 4 or 4.6? Who thinks there should be 4? Okay, hopefully more, right? 4.6? Okay, that's okay. If you're still confused, you really want to get this done. What's the type for i? Integer. Type for j? Integer. If you do division with both operands are integer, only quotients. In this case, you only get 4. So now, let's apply what we learned from the previous example over here. So there are three possible ways for you to fix this. Three possible ways. You simply want to say, I want to somehow cast either i, j, or both into a double. Okay, how do I do it? Let me show you one. I'll leave the rest to you. What I can do is, I can just choose one of them. I can print line over here, and then, let's say I want to cast i to be double. What I can do is, I can say double here, do a cast, and then put i here, and then I want to make sure this is done first. And then, the whole thing divided by j over here. Let's think about what this will do. The j over here stays to me some integer value, which is 5. And then, what this will evaluate into is going to be 23 promoted to its double counterpart, right? It's going to be 23.0. Okay? That is why when we do this whole thing over here, it's going to be uh, 4.6. Okay? And your little exercise here, you want to try to do another two possible cast. You may want to cast J, you may want to cast both I and J, but all the other two will give you the same result, which will be precise, rather than just integer cohesion. Any questions? Usually that's uh, also a very confusing point, but that's something you gotta learn. If you're trying to program, you're trying to do programming, you want to get fully control, you want to be fully knowledgeable about what you're doing, okay? And that's a very favorite question on, on the exam, okay? Hopefully you will study that, yes? Do most cast and events trigger coercion events for so forth? Okay, it's a good question. Over here, you know, I would say don't be too, don't be too stressed out about the coercion or casting, okay? Think about what, you, what we are trying to do here. In the case of the coercion, we are trying to somehow, trying to promote something from integer into double. Okay? And for the casting here, we got two scenarios over here. We can either cast, it's called upward casting or downward casting, but let's not get there, it's a little bit too confusing. Just learn about the two usages, that'll be enough. Okay. okay, we'll do one little exercise together in just a moment. Okay, I want to bring your attention to one more thing. Okay, that's exactly the three I just illustrated. Now, I want you to look at this one here. What about this one here? Is it going to do the thing I really want? Let's say I don't want any integer quotient. I want 0 0.5. Is this going to give me a 0 0.5? You can see I don't have the parentheses over there around the cast to force the order of evaluation, right? Now, to, to make my point even more straightforward to you, even clearer to you, why don't we try one more? Okay, let's try this. Integer i is 10. Integer j is, uh, let's say, 4. Okay? Now let's try, consider two lines. You can either have print line over here. Okay? Let's have consider two. Okay? First version. You have a double over here. And then I have i divided by j. And then we have another one, let's say double over here, but now notice that I have a parenthesis over here, i divided by j, 1 and 2. Okay? I want you to look at these two lines carefully. Apparently they are different syntactically. They are both valid after I put a semicolon, of course. Okay? So now I want you to think about which one is going to give me uh, the precise result I, I like? Uh, 
Okay, why don't we have a look at the second one? The second one is easier to understand, okay? You can see, first of all, again, think about what, what's really back in your mathematics. Every time, if you want to force the order of evaluation, for example, if you say uh, 3 plus 4 multiply 6, that means I want to do 3 plus 4 first before I do the multiplication, okay? Similar idea. If, if I put the parentheses over here, that means I want to do this guy over here first. So what does that mean? That means I'm going to do some integer division, right? I divided by J, what would that be? Would that be 2.5 or that, would that be 2? Two? 2. Good. Now, if I put 2 over here, and then I will try to do a cast later. What does that mean? 2.0. It's neither 2 nor 2.5, it's 2.0. So here, we've got to pay 100% uh, attention to the details. It's 2.0. Let me repeat again. Because of this parenthesis over here, it's going to force the order of evaluation. It's going to say, now let's do this integer division first, because i and j are both integers. So I'm going to do 10 divided by 4, which will be the quotient, which is 2. And then apply this cast over here into 2. So from 2, cast into 2.0. Okay? Now, what about the first one? The first one. Okay? No clue, right? Okay? I can tell you that it's going to be 2.5. But how? How? Okay, so now, my, okay, my question for you, thinking this way, okay, let's think about this. That's exactly correct, but I'll try to illustrate in a little bit more uh, familiar form. If you got 3 plus 4 multiplied by 6, I hope you know what the answer is, right? Okay, why? Because we say that this operator here, multiplication, versus this operator here, they got different precedents. Presidents. Hopefully you have heard about this term in your math class. And we say that the multiplication here has higher precedence. Sorry, precedence. Which means it should go first, by default. And this guy here, compared with the multiplication, it should be, has a lower precedence. So now where there's no parentheses, the one with the higher precedence should be done first. So it is as if. So this guy here is equivalent to, equivalent to, when I say 3 plus 4 multiplied by 6. So these two expressions are completely equivalent because multiplication has higher precedence than addition. Okay? What if I want to do 3 plus 4 first? Parenthesis, right? If I really want to do 3 plus 4 first, I will add, for example, parentheses like this. Okay? I'll do 3 plus 4 first and then multiply by 6. Okay? I'll leave that. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Now, come back to this example here. We actually got two operations over here. One is the cast. The other one is the division. Okay? There is a precedence rule you should know for this particular programming course. And that's actually quite true for every programming language. Okay? Casting has higher precedence than it's actually not just, multiple, uh, not just division, any arithmetic operation. I'll say arithmetic. Arithmetic operation. Okay, over here, so you can see that casting, we talk about arithmetic operation, and the casting itself has higher precedence. So, once you actually understand this, let's try to review this, this one specifically once more. I'm going to start a new page, okay, to make sure you really understand. Again, integer i is, okay, 10 and 4. 10 over here integer j is 4, okay? And then we're going to have, let's say, print line 
over here. We then say double over here. Okay, and then I got I divided by J. Okay, we know that over here, let me use the red one to mean it's higher precedence. Okay, uh, the orange one. This one has higher precedence than this one here. It means blue. Okay, which means by default, if there's no parenthesis there to force the order of evaluation, you gotta do cast first and then division next. So it's as if, as if we do the following. Complete equivalent to, you can say print line over here, like an option number one we had before, right? You can say double over here, and then I over here, do the cast first, and then divided by J. So these two are completely equivalents, which will just give you 2.5. Okay? Any immediate questions before you study a bit? Back home. Okay, so these are actually all the tricky cases you should really get used to, okay? Okay, so now that's it for this one here. Okay, now what about we do a simple exercise quickly, okay? Now, I want you to consider line number one to line number eight, okay? And do some um, exercise. What should be the exact printout from this fragment of code? Think about it. So how many lines should it be output eventually? One here, one here, one here, and one here. Notice that it can be tricky. You've got double type over here, but you also got cast, okay? Okay, I want to do this exercise together with you, and then we are done for this particular cast issue. Okay, why don't you take one minute to see what the output should be, what should be the four lines of output? And then we'll do it together, and then we'll see what the output should be. Okay, I'll just copy that to my iPad at the same time. Okay, okay guys, please try to remain calm back there, okay? It's actually really important. I tell you what, this is the kind of question you might get in the exam eventually. Okay. Make sure you really know how to trace them. Okay, another 20 seconds, and then we'll go over the answer together. I'll try to trace this also line by line with you. It's really important. Okay, shall we? Let's do it together. Okay, I will write out line by line with you. First of all, line number one. I have double, D1 is assigned to 3.1415926. And then I say print line over here. Okay, I have some string literal. Let's not worry about string literal. If I simply say D1, should it be, what should it be? Exactly that digit, right? There's no casting just yet. So that would be 3.1415926. Okay, good. Next one. When I say double over here, D2 is assigned to D1. Oh, by the way, up to this line here, let me just try to trace it a little better for you. Let's do this line number one. I declare a double box over here called D1 and put 3.1415926 over here. That's step number one. Step number two. When I say double D2, I simply declare just another placeholder over here called D2. And then when I say D2 is assigned to D1, I simply copy verbatim. There's no truncation whatsoever. I'm simply assigning double to double, okay? So now I'm copying the value over here into here. So 3.1415926, exactly the same, but they are two separate copies, right? Line number three. Oh, actually, line number two, let's try to print out something. If I say print line over here and D2, 
Okay, should be the same, right, as before. You also get 3.141529 uh, Okay, so now here comes the more interesting part. Let's use green. Number three, when I say integer i1, i1 is assigned to int and d1 over here. Am I trying to do casting or coercion? Casting, right? You, you don't usually say you do coercion. Coercion is done automatically for you. You only do casting by yourself. So now, which placeholder am I going to modify? There's no existing, right? I'm trying to declare a new one. Okay, right? Okay, be careful. So over here, step number three, I'm declaring I1 over here. What should be its value though? Should it be 3.1415926? No. no, three only, right? It's a cast, truncating all the fractional part. So that's, that means when I say print line over here, and then when I say I1, it's just going to be three, okay? Okay, finally, let's say number four over here. Let's say D2 is assigned to I1 multiplied by five, okay? Now, which placeholder am I trying to change? D2, right, that's a target. What value should I change it to? Depends on what's gonna be the evaluation result for I1 multiplied by five. What's I1? Three. Three, three multiplied by five is 15. Now, be careful. When I store 15 into V2, do I store 15 or something else? Should be 15.0, right? When I store integer into double placeholder, there's gonna be some promotion or coercion going on. Okay, so that means it's gonna be 15.0. So that's the most important part to get right, okay? And then for number four, okay, now that means when I say print line over here, so when I say D2, right, it's gonna give me 15.0, okay? So that's why you get this result over here. Okay, guys, are you comfortable with this? Can I leave it? Okay, good. Very good. I do want to get into if and else, at least for the basic parts. Okay? But I do want you to understand elementary program very, programming very well as well. Okay, so now, there will be two uh, exercises which I'll leave to you. Basically, it's simply to say, if I give you the code over here, line one, two, three, four, you want to judge if it is valid or not valid. Do you have any compile time error? Okay, that's something I'll leave to you. Okay, the next two slides, with all the reasons, but I would suggest try to cover them when you do the exercises, right? You really try to make sure you can do that by yourself. Okay, I'll leave 2.1 and 2.2 to you, okay? I wanna talk about one last detail, okay? It's called the augmented assignments, and this can be somehow convenient, but at the same time confusing, okay? So this, so Java is like a successor language to C, so this kind of notation comes from a C language, but you should know. If you program in C++ or you program in a C sharp, all the successor language of C, you, the notation and the similar notation apply. Why don't we try? Let's talk about an easy one. Okay. First of all, let's say this. Very often, you wanna do something like this. Let's say you're trying to, maybe we'll do some example like this in the lab. Let's say you're trying to program some simple app for bank account. You want to deposit, you want to withdraw. What does it really mean when you want to withdraw? Oh, sorry, what does it really mean when you want to deposit? Let's say, for example, if currently the balance I have is $100 in my account. Now, I want to deposit $50 into it. So now, what does it really mean I want to deposit $50? That means somehow I need to update my balance value from 100 into some new value. But what should be the new value, though? It should be the current value for the balance plus the deposit value. And similarly, if I want to do withdraw, I'll just say the current balance minus withdraw, right? So this is a kind of the assignment you will see very often. Now notice one thing. You can see somehow this part over here balance repeats itself on the left-hand side. This value here repeats itself on the left-hand side as well. If you have a pattern like this, there is a shorthand for this, okay? Let me just show you very quickly. 
Okay, for example, I'll just use another variable. Let's say integer i is, let's say, 23. Sorry, this doesn't look like a 3. Like that. So now, if I say i is assigned to i plus 46. Okay, so this is the syntax rule. Imagine that you are the compiler. Okay, so now, how do I do that? I know that i repeats itself on the right, left and right hand side. So now I can simplify this into something like this. i plus equal 46. I can do that. Similarly, similarly, you can do, for example, integer j is assigned to maybe uh, 46, and then you say integer, oh sorry, not integer. You cannot really declare that. j is assigned to j multiplied by 2. Similar idea. You can see now, again, j repeats itself over here. So you can also do similar simplification. You can say j multiply equal to 2. I have the following advice. If you find this very straightforward to you, by all means, start using it from today. It's very convenient. But if you find it very confusing, you don't have to worry about it. Okay? But you might see many of your colleagues, let's say later on if you work on a software project with your colleagues, you might see many expressions like this. At least you should know how to read it. You don't necessarily have to use it in your code. Okay? Okay, and there's another special case over here. So now over here, when you have integer, let's say k is 23, the special case is as follows. You might say k is assigned to k minus 1, for example. Okay? We know from the previous one, you can simplify this into k minus equal 1. Agree? Okay, now. You can do further simplification if you wish. In the case where the thing you're trying to do over here is simply just one, you can do another simplification further. And this can be simplified further into k minus minus. Okay? Only if this is one. That's the only case. That's the only case. Okay? Any question about these? So these are the common ones. Okay, now, another thing to show you, just for your knowledge, and the last one, confusingly, you can use plus plus and minus minus on the same line of some assignments. I'll just use one example to show you. It's very confusing, but I do have a way, hopefully, to help you understand. Again, these confusing artifacts that they exist in the language. So you might see somebody writing this code. At least when you read their code, you know what they really mean. You don't really want to use it by yourself. Okay? Because you might just confuse yourself as well. Okay, let's try this example here. Okay, let's try. Integer i is 0, and then... Okay, let's try to read it over there. I'll put it on my iPad as well. Integer j is assigned to 0 as well. And integer k is also assigned to 0. And then we have two lines there. k is assigned to i++. plus plus. And then k is reassigned to plus plus j. Okay? Let's now try to read it. Okay? Now, first of all, let's try to understand up to now. What do we have up to now? We have three placeholders, i, j, and k. i, j, and k. Zero, zero, zero. Right? Now, this is how I know, this, this is how I remember it. The plus plus over here may either occur after the variable or it may occur before the variable. Let me put a before over here. Okay? Either after or before. When the plus plus happen after the variable, that means you're going to use that variable value first before you do the plus plus. Okay? The plus plus will be done later. On the other hand, if the plus plus over here occurs before the variable, that means you're going to increment the variable's value no matter what first, and then use this variable. Okay, what do I mean? Let me make it even clearer to you. So when we see something like this, it really means the following. That means k is assigned to i, 
and then I plus plus. That's really what it means. We simply say plus plus is going to be done afterwards. Similarly, over here, what we really mean to say is k is a, oh, sorry. That means we're going to increment j first. And then k is assigned to j. Okay? You can see either the plus plus can occur before, right? Or the plus plus can occur after. That's how I remember it. So maybe after seeing this, you don't really want to write the code like this yourself, right? You might just confuse yourself. But people might write it like that. So you really want to make sure you understand. Do you want me to explain again, or are you okay? Okay, so okay, right? If you want to make, explain again, watch the video, right? You can play for it as many times as you like. Okay. Okay, now that's it for the elementary programming. So now, if you want to, so I would say beyond this lecture here, you should really create as many testers as you can and try to try all the coding examples by yourself. It's going to help you when you try to develop your own app. You can actually see how the, uh, at the elementary level, how things should work. Okay? And also, if you want to know more about data types, you can go to this particular link. That's the official link for Java. Okay? We have about 20 minutes more. I want to do something about if then else. Okay? Because for if then else, that's something you might need for your lab number one. I know many of you already finished your lab number one because the tutorial I gave to you uh, the, about spinner actually shows you exactly the if then else you want to use. However, for later lab, you do want to have a thorough understanding about if then else. Okay? So I want to talk about it using about 15 minutes or so. Okay? Guys, are we okay so far? Okay, yeah. Yeah, we can think we're doing much better this time. Good. Okay, selections. Let me just adjust this a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna do over here view and then full screen mode. Okay. I will try to talk about uh, more if and else in more details. Today I want mainly talk about syntax and give you some example. Okay? So basically, the whole lecture, you can see we got 57 slides. I don't, I don't intend to finish them today. I cannot even finish them next Monday, but it will take some time. Okay? But everything is already on the, slide, uh, on the website. You can go over them if you want, but I'll, I'll promise I'll go over every example with you in the class, but it might be a little bit behind. Okay? Okay, we talk about Boolean data type, and then we talk about if statements, and then we talk about compound versus a primitive, and then we talk about common errors, and then the most complicated part is logical operations. Any one of you is taking 1090 or 1019 this semester. Okay? So that's something you will get into. Conjunction, disjunction, negation. That's like a practical aspect of the logical operations. So hopefully this can be a, a new perspective to the, log, uh, to the logic. Okay? We'll get there. Maybe not today, but definitely next week. Okay. Now, the motivating example, I'll get there very quickly next time. I do want to go to if then else statement right away. Okay? Let's talk about syntax. Since we are computer scientists, we try to think a little bit more abstractly. Okay? I'll show you exactly the syntax now. Okay? Let me just not use the slides. Let me use iPad. Okay? So we talk about selections. The idea is somehow very simple. Rather than going from top to the bottom in a single line thread of control, we want to say if something is true, we go here. If it is not true, we go elsewhere. Okay, that's kind of, uh, what, uh, the, the, kind of the idea. Okay, let's try. The simplest syntax for if then else you can have is you have a keyword called if. Parenthesis over here, and then curly brackets curly brackets over here, that's the simplest one you can have. But what should really occur over here, that's the most important part. Okay, over here is going to be some Boolean expression in general. So Boolean expression simply means it's going to be some value that's going to evaluate to either true or false. For example, I can say Let's say let's let's talk, consider the following program. 
If I say integer, i is assigned to 23. Okay? I can say the following. If i is larger than 0, and we learned about relational operations in the elementary programming. So, should this be true or false? True. So what does true mean? That means we're going to execute whatever that's inside this particular block over here. Okay? If i is not true, let's think about another case over here. Let's say this is case number one. Okay? Let's think about an independent case. Case number two. If I say, rather than declaring i to the initial value of 23, what if I said the following? Integer i is assigned to, let's say, minus 23. Okay? So we got two possible things, right? Okay? You know what? To really uh, not to have you confused, let me do the following. Okay? That's number one. Let's say number two over here. Okay? It's completely separate. Okay? I don't want to confuse you. And then over here, I have integer, let's say j, is 20, let's say minus 24. And then I say if over here, i, uh, sorry, j, j is larger than zero, the same condition over here. And then I can do something here, out of, yeah, like that. So, but you can see syntactically speaking, they are similar. We are using, we're just using a single if over here. And then the condition over here can either be true or false. In the first case, i larger than zero is true. That means we are going to execute whatever that's in here. Okay? In the second case, we can see that minus 24 larger than zero is false. That means we're going to bypass whatever that's inside this particular bracket here. Okay, let's do some simple, uh, simple exercise over here. Okay, let's say an example over here. i is integer j, okay, 24 minus 1. If i multiply j, is larger than zero. In that case, I'm going to print out something. Okay, I'm going to say positive. Positive over here. And then, I'm going to do another line over here. Print line. And then we have, let's say, hello. Okay? So now let's try to understand what's going on over here. So we have if statement over here, and then we have a relational expression over here. In this case, is it going to be valid to true or false? False, right? 24 multiply minus 1. We actually get, so this is 24, this is minus 1, so we get minus 24. Minus 24 larger than 0 is going to be false. That means whatever that's over here, we are, we're going to bypass. We're not even going into this particular branch. We're not going in there. What we will do is just go outside the branch and start from the next line. That means we're simply going to have hello. Okay? Just hello. Okay? Now, I'll, I'll try to use the same program structure over here. I'm going to use a different color. Okay? Let's use maybe green over here. Now, let's do the following. Let's say I got 3 over here. i is 3, alternatively. And j is, let's say, 4 in this case. So now, if I try to execute the same block of code, I got 3 multiply 4. Larger than 0? True. True means I'm actually going to go inside the so-called body of this particular branch and execute everything there line by line. In this case, we're going to print out positive. And then, once we exit from this particular branch, we're also going to execute this line here. So that means we got 
positive and also hello. Okay. Any question about this simple example here? So that's the easiest one you can get, easiest one. Okay. And then I'm gonna make this slightly more complicated. Uh, one more thing I want to show you. There's one way you can understand the program by drawing some flow chart, some flow diagram. Let's try to see exactly how this is going to work. Okay. Now uh, I'm going to draw a diagram over here. Okay. Every assignment or every statement there is going to be a rectangle box. Every decision point, boolean condition is going to be a diamond. Let's try that. We say, uh, let me use uh, maybe pink over here. So I'm going to have integer i is assigned to 24. So this is the first statement. And the error over here is the flow of your program. Okay? We execute this first. And then after this, followed by, we also try to execute this line here. Integer j is assigned to minus 1. Okay? After that, we go to this decision point over here. After that, we have a diamond over here, which means we check to see if i multiply j is larger than zero. Okay? That's a decision point, which can be either true or false in general, right? Okay? In the case where it is true, for example, true over here, that means we're going to execute every line inside a branch. In this case, we're going to have over here positive. It's going to print out positive. And then after this, we're going to go into the hello printout. OK? Now, a question for you. You can see that this is actually the true branch. What about the false branch? Where should I draw the arrow into? The false one. You can see that if it happens to be false, over here, I got two options here. Either I can say I will draw the arrow over here. Would that be right? No, because in that case, I also print out positive when it's false. Okay, so that means the right way to draw it is after false, I will join over here. So that's the flow chart for this simplest uh, if then else example. Okay. Okay, we got five more minutes. I can do one more example, slightly more complicated. Draw the diagram, and we are done. Okay, one more example. I think that'll be enough for your uh, lab exercise one. We'll do it in complete details next Monday. Okay. Okay, let's do one more. Let's make it slightly more complicated. Slightly. Okay, let's try this. Integer. Okay. Oh, one more thing to show you. I think that'll be worth doing. Okay. Now you can see that we got two possible flows, right? So now you can see the first flow, we got 24 and minus 1. Let's see exactly what that flow should be. So that'll be red. Okay, let's try. So now that means do this, do this, and check it. It will be false. So that means we go all the way from here to here. We only print out hello. That's the first example. And the second one over here is uh, green, which means we got three here and four here, okay? So let's try to put it in parallel. So we still execute this, we still execute this, the flow. Up to here, we are okay. And then we go to the decision point. Now, I multiply by j larger than zero with three and four. That should be true. In that case, we're going to go in this branch over here, which means we're gonna execute positive, and then we also go into this to execute hello. So the hello over here is executed by both the green and the red. Okay, hopefully you see that flow, right? Okay. Okay, one more example. Okay, let's see this. Let's do it quickly. Integer i is I'll do the same. Twenty-four integer j is minus one. And then if I multiply by j is larger than zero, I can have positive. Primary positive. Now, there's a new keyword you should know. Something called else. Else. 
else simply means if this is not true, then we go to the other one. Okay? Otherwise, we go for primary negative. Okay, I'll just say negative. Okay? And then afterwards, I say primary over here, and then I'll say hello. I make it sufficiently similar to the previous one, but it's not exactly the same. Okay? Now, why don't we draw the flow chart and try? Okay? Let's draw the flow chart very quickly. That's the flow of the program, integer i is assigned to 24 over here, followed by integer j is assigned to minus 1, for example. Okay? And then followed by if it's so a decision point, i multiplied by j is larger than 0, which can be either true or false. Okay? Let's say true is here and false is the other way. If it is true, then we will write positive. Okay? We'll print out positive. Okay? And then if it is false, then we'll print out negative. The reason that I put these two boxes in parallel, that means you only execute exactly one, but not both. Okay? So after the true, so both of these are going to join into a single point over here. Oh, let me draw a little bit better. Over here, and over here. And then it's going to be over here, and then. Okay, let's try to see with the current values of 24 and minus 1, what, what's going to be the flow when we execute the program? Let's try. So now let's say we have, let's use blue over here. We execute this, i is going to be 24. Execute this, j is going to be minus 1. We reach a decision point. Should we go to false or true? False, right? 24 minus, uh, times minus 1, 20, uh, minus 24. False over here, that means print out negative. And then we go to the common one, which is going to print out hello. Okay? So now, let's say we modify your program slightly, slightly. Let's say I want to do the following. Rather than 24 and minus 1, let's do 3 and 4. 3 and 4 over here. Everything else remains the same. Now, i and j changes because they're variables. Now, let's use green over here. So now, uh, let me just do, the, do that one as well. Now, let's change that to 3 and change that to 4. Okay? So now, let's try that. So now, execute this line. i is now 3. Execute this line. j is now 4. And then we reach the same decision point. Now, 3 times 4 larger than 0 is true. So now we go to this branch instead, like this branch over here. And then over there, we, st we print out positive over here. And then we still go to the common line over here, which we also print out hello. Okay, so now let me go back to the code to annotate once more. This branch is only for the true, and this branch is only for the false. Okay, outside the if statement there, outside the if and outside the else, it's going to be executed by both. Okay, over here you can see hello, it's going to be executed by the true, and also executed by the false. Okay, give me 20 more seconds, I'll tell you what's going to happen. So, your job this week is going to, if you haven't watched uh, the tutorial series, you should really do, otherwise you're behind. And then finish lab number one. Next week, starting from Monday, is a grading day for your register section. I know many of you may still try to swap your lab sessions there, good luck. But I would say, when, when me and my TAs, when we grade you, we'll look at your official registration list. If we see that you're registered in section one, but you're not there, you don't, you don't get any marks. So make sure you show up in the right section. Okay? So now, what's going to happen in the lecture next week? I'll try to finish a, a very good part of the if then else. The week after, which is the week before your lab test one, we will do some objects and classes. Okay? I will see you in the labs in the next week's lecture. <laughs>